The Federal Reserve is currently standing in front of a huge mountain of inflation with a shovel and a mission. Get to digging and hopefully level everything out. Now instead of doing yet another Federal Reserve episode where I rattle off the same sort of numbers, maybe interest rates will go up a quarter of a percentage point, or if you're feeling a little saucy, half a percent. I thought I'd instead open up the history books to the last time America was facing this monumental problem. Enter the 1980s, a time where President Reagan and Federal Reserve Chair Paul Volcker were butting heads over one specific issue, inflation. You see, Volcker hated inflation like it killed his father in the opening scene of a kung fu movie. Fighting inflation is actually what got top billing on Volcker's obituaries. Wow. Reagan, on the other hand, well, he was of the opinion that we can let inflation run a bit high as long as we keep that growth churning. So, what happened the last time America tried to take down record breaking inflationary numbers? Well, the year 1979, and America was grappling with Jimmy Carter's new Federal Reserve nominee, Paul Volcker. The question on everyone's mind was, does this guy have the cojones to take on America's 11% inflation rates? Now, economically speaking, it was an incredibly confusing time. Nobody had a job, yet prices were consistently going up. Who's spending all this cash to drive up those prices? Do we speed up the economy by giving people more access to money, or do we slow it down to get inflation back into check? That well, that was the million dollar question, or million two thousand dollar question, sorry inflation. Now in 1979, two problems were converging into one perfectly optimized crisis. First, you had a slowing economy. Manufacturing jobs were starting to get outsourced for the first time, and Nixon era protectionist policies were the law of the land. You see, under Nixon a few years earlier, some major changes had been made to monetary policy that were contributing to this 1979 economic situation. First, well, America pulled out of the gold standard, meaning the United States dollar's value were free to go on a journey of self-discovery and find their true internal worth. Before that point, every American dollar was backed by a specific certain amount of gold signaling in a vault. You can exchange a dollar for a sane ounce of gold. Want to print more money? Well, you better open up a mine. All of a sudden, the chains were gone on the dollar and the federal government could print at a therefore unknown rate. The only limit now was the toner. At the same time, to protect American jobs from outsourcing, Nixon had put a 10% tariff on all imports, which started driving up the prices of goods. Because it was still cheaper to produce abroad, but now we have to pay this huge import tax on top of the price of the item. Now, During this period, all the numbers were still heading firmly in the right direction. But it was clear that the gravy train had left the station and that the government was going to have to start doing a bit of the pushing to keep everything headed in the right direction. Unfortunately, with all this money printing and tariffs, by the end of the decade, inflation was becoming a problem that was too big to be ignored. The economy was well, growing slowly, while currency is losing its value quickly. The hammer really came down when the other problem came into place. The Middle East stopped selling us oil. It was a full blown embargo. You want to send that TV from the warehouse to the store? Well, that's going to cost you. Prices shot up, and the stage was set for quite the decision. We got an oil crisis, slowing growth, and a whole bunch of newly printed money. Should we keep trying to grow the economy, or should we instead focus our attention on getting inflation back into check? Now, the monetary policy that was inherited by Paul Volcker was one of abundant caution. It was prioritizing sustaining growth over actually putting a cap on inflation. The New York Times wrote, while Volcker's predecessor has sought to reduce inflation, he has given an unusual amount of attention for a central banker to avoiding inducing a recession in the process. 
You see, his philosophy was that recessions did not cure inflation and that the Federal Reserve should instead be tightening money slowly over a period of 5 or 6 years to permanently reduce inflation. In 1979, the Federal Reserve's mentality appeared to be something close to, oh god, oh god, what, what do we do? Alright, deep breath, deep breath, deep breath. What if we don't really do anything? We, we won't make anything better, sure, but we also won't make anything worse. Let's prioritize neither growth nor fighting inflation, just sort of turtle up and wait for one of these larger societal problems to blow over. Then came the man of the hour, Paul Volcker, and he had a different idea. He kicked the door to the Federal Reserve open and said, we're fighting inflation, growth be damned. Overnight, the federal funds rate was raised 4% to a then record high of just over 15%. So sounds extreme, but what does any of that mean? You see, conversations on Federal Reserve policy generally devolve into the economic equivalent of watching a Fast and Furious movie. Well, his number seems to be going up on the dashboard faster than the other guy's is, so he's winning. Now that upward pointing line represents a one stop shop where the Federal Reserve can influence the economy by either slowing it down or stimulating it. This rate has a bunch of different names. You got the federal funds rate, the key interest rate, or just rates if your financial reporter is shooting from the hip a bit. Now this federal funds rate, that's going to play a pretty key part in the middle section of this episode, so pay attention to the description. It represents the rate at which the Federal Reserve charges banks to borrow money from the federal government in overnight loans. Now, I know that sounds way too incredibly specific to be at all powerful, but hear me out for a sec. So you're given a bank carte blanche access to federal funds at, say it's 6% interest. Well, that kind of becomes the baseline value of money in a bank's mind. You see, I'm always going to have access to cash from the federal government at a 6% interest rate. That means that if I want to lend you money, well, you're going to have to pay more than that 6% so I can earn a little bit of profit by scraping some percentage off the top. Now, similarly, if you're looking to put your money into a savings account that I control, well, you're never going to get more than 6% for your cash because I could always just borrow it from the federales at a 6% interest rate. And that is a lot less fuss than begging you for it. Why would I pay more for the same amount of money? Now to summarize all that confusing stuff I just said, it's called the key interest rate for a reason. There are a whole bunch of other rates that rise and fall when you start tinkering with it. Now to zoom out of the picture a little bit, alright, so you're a consumer now trying to figure out what to do with your money. If your savings account is paying out pennies on the dollar, you're probably not going to hesitate to go out and buy that new flat screen TV. Start raising the price to double digit interest rates on the bank accounts though, and well, saving your money starts to become a bit more appealing. Higher rates means everything slows down, people start saving money and taking out fewer loans, and inflation just sort of comes back into line slowly but surely. Volcker's primary concern here was focused on locking down some of that money supply. We just printed all this new money and we gotta get it out of the supply and into the savings accounts. His first step was to raise interest rates above the rate of inflation so that if you put your money into a bank, it would continue to at least maintain its value. From there, rates just kept going up and savers were making bank. So this brings us to a broader question. Why would the Federal Reserve be in such a hurry to get people dropping their shopping? Well, you see, Volcker's moves were based on the fact that inflation isn't just based on the existence of some new money on a disconnected balance sheet. Hypothetically speaking, if I print out $10 trillion and then immediately lock that money into a safe without telling anyone, well, there's a lot of new money out there, but none of it is being spent. Inflation shouldn't go up. Novoko's goal was to get people to voluntarily lock up their money into savings accounts rather than going out there and spending it. 
Now this was an incredibly controversial strategy to take because people choosing to save rather than spend immediately triggered a deep multi-year recession. For the remainder of this episode, Volcker is not going to be very popular with the politicians. You see, in his early years at the Fed, critics of his radical swerve towards rate hikes were arguing that his core inflationary concerns were misplaced. In their minds, it wasn't the increased spending that was pulling prices higher, but instead it was this darn oil embargo and all these import tariffs that were increasing costs across the board and pushing up the prices. New York Times was reporting, if the Arabs begin to think the same way and therefore moderate their oil price increases, it will appear as if inflation is coming down sooner than a change in the monetary policy could really achieve. Simply put, if the oil embargoes were driving inflation, well then raising rates would just be adding insult to injury. Less spending isn't going to make that shipment from the warehouse to the store any cheaper. Still, Volcker persisted, and his huge rate hikes dropped down inflation from astronomical levels to just stratospheric levels. Then 1981 happened, bringing with it two major changes. First, the oil shortages took an incredibly abrupt 180, and suddenly there was too much oil. Oh no, the prices were plummeting to the point where all of a sudden it became a problem in the other direction. Man, can that industry just ever find a sweet spot? Not surprising some at the time, the change did not seem to have any major impacts on inflation. Guess companies like to raise prices a lot more than they like to lower them. Now the second major change that happened was the Gipper was now in office, and he had some new ideas for how to solve this Federal Reserve created recession. We're going to make huge tax cuts and we're going to get people to spend all of that new money. They're going to spend all of their new tax money. R right, Volker? Uh, you planning on lowering those rates? We got inflation down to 10%. That's good enough for me. Well, that was not good enough for Volker, and he reaffirmed his frequently stated opposition to any move by the Federal Reserve to force interest rates lower, despite the growing pressure in the Congress for the Federal Reserve to bring interest rates down quickly in order to stimulate a recovery. Now, Volker said that forcing down interest rates would sort of reignite all the inflation he had spent so much time fighting. His major concern was that now lowering the rates too quickly would unleash all of those savings and just lead to a huge spike in prices. All that pain and hard work would have been wasted. Now this put America in an incredibly weird position where the government was handing out all this money and huge tax breaks to increase spending while simultaneously that same government was telling people, hey, hey, hey don't spend that money. How about you save it? Have you seen the interest rates that the banks are paying out right now? Don't, don't spend them money. Seriously, save it. One of us is telling the truth and the other is telling lies. We're both politicians, so good luck figuring that one out. Now at this point in the tale, some people over at the Federal Reserve are starting to eye that emergency exit a little bit. Should we be reprioritizing our values from suppressing inflation to instead ending our little interest rate produced recession? And similarly, what would a stimulation off ramp even look like? Now, inflation was certainly lower than it was at its peak, but everyone was sure that we were still firmly in the woods, with numbers hovering around 10%. Volcker's off-ramp requirements still largely revolved around the amount of cash circulating in the economy. Your boy's consistent. Now in his mind, it was a trade-off between, alright, we grow the monetary pool a little bit and I lower rates a little bit. Don't start dumping all this new money in. Everyone was starting to dip their toes back into the growth pool again. And the New York Times reported that Volcker reduced some of the friction when he announced that the Federal Reserve would allow basic monetary supply to grow at a rate in the upper half of the Fed's target range for that year. The Reagan administration had also said it wanted growth in the upper range. And so, see, everyone was happy again. The monetary base was slowly growing, and that slow growth was firmly on the Federal Reserve's terms. 
Now this easing of the reins restricted growth approach led to a multi-year slowing of inflation and a multi-year slowly regrowing of the economy. Then Greenspan replaced Volcker, the Soviet Union fell, and it was back off to the races again. So now to the final part of this video, analysis. And this part might date this episode more than the timestamp in the corner. Our current Federal Reserve Governor, Jerome Powell, is a bit less concerned with the monetary pool. Dude printed money like there was no tomorrow. Instead, he seems to be taking a shooting from the hip sort of approach to regulation, and he is sort of reacting to average inflationary changes. You see, the current Federal Reserve's stated goal is to have the average inflation be around 2%. So if it goes a bit above for a while, and then a bit under that for a while, we'll call it good. And now, of course, it's gone well over that limit. Consensus right now seems to be, we're not really sure why, and we're monitoring a few things. We got oil prices, we got spending rates, we got employment, we got all sorts of things, and we're going to play it by year. I mean, word on the street is Powell's considering a half percentage point increase. Maybe. That's the riskiest option on the table. Volcker's predecessor was raising rates faster than that, and that dude was considered cautious for the time. My point here being, Powell's mentality seems to be, alright, we're gonna sort of fight inflation, see, I'm raising rates over here, but not to the point where the economy is gonna tip over into a recession. Just sort of set this inflation fight on the back burner while America works at its whole oil price thing and oh, can't forget the COVID stuff, and the 2024 election, that could be volatile, and then uh, 10 years out we're probably going to have some climate change that we could intend with. Point is, fighting inflation is painful for everyone, politicians, investors, people with jobs and are losing them. And it doesn't seem like the institution that has been tasked with solving this problem is taking the proper steps to solve it. Won't get worse, but people seem to be more focused on sustaining some sort of growth. Still, depending on your perspective, that might be a positive thing. Who am I to tell you how to think? Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I'd like to thank my patrons over here for helping me put out my videos. If you want to support independent, non-partisan news looking into the overlooked, join this growing list of exceptional individuals by clicking on that link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring. If you like what you saw, give me a thumbs up, and lastly, as always, thank you for watching.